What really happened with your host, Mike Rivero? Because World War Three is a really bad idea. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And Aloha America. Welcome to our show. It's Monday, May 23rd, 2011. Just about one week until June. Wow, how time flies when you're fighting the fascists. And uh, obviously, uh, the bad news is for those of you who were planning on looting the homes of your neighbor. Hood Christians this week, it's canceled. It's off. The rapture did not happen. Repeat, the rapture did not happen. We got plenty of tornadoes, plenty of flooding. We got 20 foot snowpacks up there in the Rocky Mountains that when they melt are going to cause even more flooding. But the rapture did not happen happen. So uh, we're all here having a, a great deal of fun at the expense of the uh, the end of the world believers and so forth and so on. Uh, and I'm already getting all these emails from people saying, oh, well, those people who believe that, those aren't the real Christians. We're the real Christians over here and all those others, those aren't real Christians. And it kind of reminds everybody that Christianity is not a faith. It's about 150 to 200 different tiny splinter faiths that share a few common principles and otherwise sneer at each other over the fine details. Now then, the other big story over the weekend, of course, was the denial of service attack on the domain registration uh, company DirectNIC, which is one of the largest domain registrars in the world. And DirectNIC itself was not really hacked. They weren't broken into. The actual attack was on what are called the domain name servers. And what it is, whoever was behind this, and I'm going to tell you who I think it was uh, a little bit later, uh, they went out and they found a way to go into the domain name servers. These are the actual machines. When you type in whatreallyhappened.com, the, the system that translates that to the IP and points you at our servers, uh, that's the domain name server. And the, the hackers got into those and started playing with the lookup tables so that instead of going to my website, uh, you were going to websites that were serving up malware. There was uh, uh, something about take a chance, win a prize. There was a whole bunch of different ones in play here. And it was just general mayhem out there. There was uh, apparently somebody had a clone of my site from like two months ago with old stories, and that was coming up for some people. And it was just a, a huge, huge mess. They're still sorting out the, the last fine details. But mail service was disrupted. Uh, getting the web pages was disrupted. The denial of service attack on DirectNIC appears to have been a distraction, basically because the domain name server lookup tables are updated automatically on a regular basis. And the next time they were updated automatically from DirectNIC, all of the hacking and intrusion would be erased, and it would go back to being normal. It's a self-repairing system. So the denial of service attack on DirectNIC appears to have been an effort to keep the damage lasting as long as possible, possible to prevent DirectNIC from uh, automatically repairing these router lookup tables in the domain name servers. Now, who did this and why? Uh, was it just a bunch of hackers who decided this was a really cool weekend to go out and steal a lot of credit card numbers? Could very well have been. Maybe. 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 But it was so large and heavy-handed and obvious, I'm not sure. These days, hackers try and stay below notice. If they steal your credit card number, they don't put $5,000 on your credit card because it leaps out at you. You know you've been, you've been had. The hackers like to steal a million credit cards and hit each one of them for just a couple of bucks. They still become millionaires, but 99% of the people who have credit cards don't uh, go through the, the uh, charges item by item. And they'll, they'll overlook. They'll miss a 2 or 5 or $10 charge. They won't pay any attention to it, and they won't report it, and they don't get caught. The hackers don't get caught. So something this heavy-handed appears to have been designed to attract attention. Now, some people are wondering if this was a test of being able to take down the Internet ahead of a new false flag. If that was the case, it was kind of a flub. Pretty much all the key websites were back up within a few hours. So that may have been a flub. But as a justification for Obama's new enhanced cybersecurity initiative, which will license the net and bloggers, yeah, that's a good, that's a good likelihood. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
and aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. Manny's in the control room, twiddling the dials and answering your phone calls if you care to share your words of wisdom with us on the program today. Now, we're talking about this uh, hacking operation that happened over the weekend that disrupted a lot of websites, not just mine. Uh, denial of service attack on DirectNIC, the dom- domain registry, and for everybody using their name servers, it shut down their websites. Uh, obviously, today, we're all dispersing out to other name servers elsewhere, so this is not going to happen to us again. So as a test of a weapons system or a way to take down the whole net, it's kind of flood because everybody's already adapting to it, and this methodology, which didn't work all that well anyway, will be almost completely ineffective probably by the end of the week here. But this might have been a political exercise, okay, because remember, we live under a government that as we can see from the tornadoes and the flooding and the oil in the Gulf of Mexico and the radioactivity all over the West Coast and Wall Street running rampant over all of our uh, pocketbooks here, this is a government that can't actually deal with the real world. They're inept, incompetent. They're all lawyers and politicians. They've never grown anything. They've never built anything. They don't know how to repair the roads. All they know how to do is yak at each other, take money, and give it to their cronies. They can't handle a real crisis. So the way they keep control over America is they'll manufacture a crisis out of nothing. And they'll talk about it, and they'll pontificate about it, and they'll sell you a solution, usually in exchange for increased taxation and reduction of your freedoms. War on poverty, war on drugs, war on carbon dioxide, war on dangling participles, whatever. Okay, and I want to remind everybody... Uh, What happened back in 1995? I mean, the Internet. Remember, the Internet was never supposed to be made public. You know, a mass communication media that individuals can use that is not under government control was never supposed to happen. The ARPANET was set up exclusively for for the use of the U.S. military and its contractors at universities and private companies around the world, and people would put it in their home. And the government, when it tried to reassert control over the Internet, who was allowed to use it in the 1970s, the people running the backbone machine said, we'll pay for it from now on. We don't need your funding. And that was uh, called the Great Revolt, and that's when the ARPANET became the Internet and broke free from government control. And ever since, the government's been trying to figure out some way to get it back under control so that you don't see what the government doesn't want you to see. So back in 1995, when the government was already in a panic that certain crimes, like the murder of White House Deputy Counsel Vincent Foster, were getting out to the public, Senator James Exxon, Democrat of Nebraska, started campaigning for what was called the Exxon Amendment to the Telecommunications Reform Act, which was going to punish anybody using indecency or obscenity on the Internet. And what was really interesting, this is a textbook example of how the government will create a crisis in order to sell you a solution. For about a month before the debate was scheduled on the Exxon Amendment, there was pornography pouring onto the Internet just flood stage, absolute flood stage. Now, this this was back in the days when most people were sharing stuff through what was called Usenet. This is before web pages and browsers came along. And Usenet was kind of a sort of a, a news posting system. And it had categories. And if you were interested in things like seeing naked ladies, there was a naked lady group. And if you were interested in things like cookie recipes, there was a cookie recipe group. And there were groups about grooming your dog. And there were, grooms, uh, there were groups about, uh, you know, archaeology and art and music and, and just you know, what the, the entire uh, uh, range of human interests were in these various Usenet groups, and they were sectioned off. For, for people who wanted pornography, there was a little separate little area for them. Go have fun over there. In this case, the pornography was being thrown into every Usenet group. Very inappropriate. The, 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 the cooking groups were getting these pictures. And the people in Usenet would tell these posters, please, there are places where you're supposed to take this. And the posters would get very rude and uh, arrogant, and I have a First Amendment right to put this picture here among the brownie recipes, and just really over the top. So we all did a little bit of digging, and we found out that all of these pornography pictures that were going into the very inappropriate places on Usenet were coming from .gov and .mil servers. It was all government stuff. And we tracked it all back to this source, and we we confirmed that it was basically a massive government propaganda operation to create the illusion that the entire net was out of control and filled with pornography so that Senator Exxon could get up there and scream about the scourge of porn on the net and the requirement for government control. And as soon as the uh, debate started, 
the flood of porn turned off like a switch was thrown. You know, bink, and it was gone. Problem was over. Obviously, obviously a manufactured crisis to justify loss of freedom on the Internet. And we've seen this time and time again. The government will create the illusion of a problem and then sell you a solution in exchange for your money and your freedoms. And since then, of course, uh, covert government agencies have set up these um, front groups like Domains by Proxy, where when they set up these kind of operations like phony Al-Qaeda websites, they're harder to track down now. Even though under ICANN rules, they're not supposed to exist, but they still set these things up. So that's the way these things uh, get done. The government puts the pornography on the net so the government can stand up and say, we must have control over the Internet. So, you know, keeping in mind, I mean, looking through my server logs, Department of Homeland Security has been prowling around really good on my server. And I, I think they're either checking for damage or whatever. But at this point, my number one suspect for last weekend's Directnik DDoS and the deliberate corruption of the lookup tables on the domain name service is the U.S. government itself or some of their contractors over in Israel. Because we've got Barack Obama, who's already talking about a new cybersecurity initiative. We're already seeing the inevitable flood of articles into the computer technical journal saying, oh, we must rebuild the Internet in order to bring computer crime back under control. And, of course, we had Barack Obama meeting with the top uh, uh, executives of Silicon Valley only, uh, let, let's see, February, I think. Yeah, it was back in February where he went to them and said, we must prepare so that what happened in Egypt, where social media led the revolution against that fascist dictatorship, can't happen here because we all love our fascist dictatorship, and we don't want to have that happen here. And so now we're seeing this push to redo the Internet so that the government can control what is and is not on there, all in the name of your own safety and your own protection, of course. And frankly, we've seen this before not in computers, in books back in 1933 when the Nazis were doing the book burning. That's what it was about. You're only allowed to see the information the dictator says is good for you. And back in, 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 in the Nazi Germany, they burned the books. And here in the United States of America, they're seizing domains. And they always have a really good excuse. Oh, it's porn. It's intellectual property violation. It's piracy. But we know what the real target is. The real target is the right of the American people to have enough information to make good choices at the ballot box or ultimately the ammo box. Thomas Jefferson said the highest duty of every American is to keep themselves fully informed so they can make good choices. And the government does not want you to be fully informed. The government wants to make sure you only have the knowledge that will lead you to decide of your own free will what the government want you to do that's all mind control is controlling the brain by controlling what it knows and the government and the media have lost that control because of the internet and the blogs and they're trying to get it back and they're trying to trick you out of your free internet they're trying to trick you out of your public forum so that once again it'll just be the government control media telling you oh yes iran has a nuclear iran they're bad they have nuclear weapons we have to go we have no choice but to go kill israel's enemies so right now where you are right now the blogosphere the internet this is now the high ground in the war for the future of the nation and the world it's not on the front lines of afghanistan or somalia or yemen it's right here in cyberspace. This is a reformation being fought in the virtual world. And the other side is already starting to crank up their, their big artillery. And I think that was the reason for this very obvious denial of service attack on Directnik. It was almost designed to call attention to the fact that it was happening. And that's why I think it's part of a propaganda uh, buildup for seizing control of the net and putting it back under computer control. So, all righty, moving right along here. Um, something the media is not paying a lot of attention to, and the blogosphere started really today, is the lack of media coverage about the, the, the scale of the flooding in the American Midwest. And we put some uh, pictures up on whatreallyhappened.com, and you can go find them all over the place. It's really major flooding. It's even worse than what followed Katrina. 
And it's sort of getting downplayed. I mean, the media and the government is all about, oh, Israel and Palestine and, and Syria and blah, 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 and all that other stuff. And they're, they're not, you know, just like they stopped talking about the Gulf of Mexico last July, they're not talking all that much about the flooding. The local news channels obviously are because they're in it. But at the, at the network national level, you know, it, it comes down toward the bottom of the show. It's just not considered that important, and I'll tell you why. And it has to do with the fact that, as I said before, relative to this uh, direct Nick denial of service attack, the U.S. government cannot actually deal with the real world. They only perpetuate their power by creating phony crises that they can conveniently then take care of by selling you a solution for more taxes or less freedom. So the flooding that we're seeing in the United States of America is another gold-plated key light lit example of the U.S. government's failure to take care of the United States of America. They're over there taking care of Israel, brand new roads over there, new rockets, new missiles, new bombs to kill Palestinians, and they have neglected this country because the flood control has collapsed. Bridges are collapsing, mines are caving in, oil wells are blowing up, the roads are crumbling. This country is falling apart because the United States government is obsessed with Israel and helping Israel and being good to Israel and taking care of Israel. And if you as an American stand up and complain that your tax dollars are not being spent to make this country any better, you're called an anti-Semite. We're going to take a break and be right back after these words from our sponsors. What this country is coming to, I sure would like to know. If they don't do something by and by, the rich will live and the poor will die. Doggone, I mean the panic is on. And Aloha America, welcome back to the show. And there's another reason for why the corporate media is de-emphasizing uh, all of the flooding all across America, and will continue to do so. Uh, because all of that flood water didn't just appear out of nowhere. It's melted snow. We had record snow this last winter. Still do. 20-foot snowpack in parts of the Rocky Mountains out in the west. And they're expecting major, major problems when it starts melting, which it should. We're only Soon we're only a week away from June. But the U.S. government and Barack Obama are still desperate to impose a carbon tax because they're broke. And they have got no money left. They're already looting the pension fund of their own workers to try and float this little system along. And they're desperate to get you to pay a carbon tax. And that's all hooked into this whole global warming hoax. See, there's a difference between Al Gore and Harold Camping. Harold Camping actually believed the world was going to come to an end. He was wrong. And so was Al Gore. But Camping has the decency to leave town now that he's been exposed as a fraud. But Al Gore and his people are going to come back. This summer, as soon as they get high temperatures they can play with, they're going to be back there, global warming, the end of the world, unless you pay a carbon tax and do what we tell you and lower your standard of living and give us all your money, you're all going to die horrible deaths. <laughs> and it is a crock, and it is quite odoriferous, to put it delicately. So obviously, reports of major spring flooding deriving from really heavy winter snows is not politically correct. It is incompatible with political doctrine and tax policy. And that's another reason it's being de-emphasized. It's just like last July when all of a sudden the corporate media stopped reporting about the Gulf oil disaster. It was just officially declared not an issue. We don't worry about that anymore. It's the same reason why even now Fukushima is being de-emphasized. The, the Japanese news is still saying they're in total confusion over there. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how to deal with it. Here in the United States, hardly a mention anymore. Last video from Fukushima is showing glowing slag starting to leak from the pile of rubble. And here in our news, it's all about, oh, Israel and Palestine and two-state solution and Syria and Lebanon and, you know, Boy, I'm so glad that everything in this country is running so smoothly and our, our government has left over time to go and worry about Israel because, by golly, if they were over there obsessing about Israel and we had, like, oh, for example, a crashing economy and crumbling roads and falling bridges and, you know, toxic pollutants all over the Gulf of Mexico, I would sort of kind of want them to be paying attention to that stuff. Now, the global warming cultists, the devotees of the Goracle, 
are out there saying the tornadoes prove that there's global warming. See? See? The tornadoes are the result of global warming. Not exactly. Tornadoes, and indeed hurricanes, are not the result of warming, but of a temperature differential. They have tornadoes on Mars. They have major hurricanes on Jupiter and Saturn. There's a big one forming on Saturn right now. And those places are a lot colder than Earth. So it's not automatic that heat means tornadoes and hurricane. It's a temperature differential, a difference between what is cold and what is hot. You can get just as severe tornadoes and hurricanes by cooling the ground and ocean as you can by warming the atmosphere. They're hoping that you don't know enough science to spot the obvious lies. We're going to go to the phones. Chris in Nevada. Aloha, Chris. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, hi, Michael. I was kind of taking a little note of what you were saying, and I know that you and our favorite uh, weather modification program, the HARP, they've supposedly been tuned up and operating in the New Madrid Fault area. Uh, oh, come on. Come on. Chris, 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 come on. We, we've had enough of this nonsense and thank you very much, but we're going to let you go. All right. Anytime the government gets really nervous that you're looking at the things that you shouldn't be looking at, like how the U.S. government has allowed our infrastructure to collapse, they're going to start going in there with harp and chemtrails and Apollo moon landings were faked and the rest of it. Now, for those of you who are even at all curious, harp. In fact, I'm going to back up a little bit more. There was a very interesting show on National Geographic last night. They were talking about Area 51 and the stories of space aliens. And they admitted on the show, on National Geographic, that the U.S. Air Force was deliberately putting out stories about flying saucers and captured space aliens because they didn't want anybody, especially in Russia, knowing about the top secret aircraft that were being developed there something called um, Oxcart, which was the, the predecessor for the SR-71. I was not even aware that there would actually been an earlier version of the SR-71 that had been uh, tested out there. And so the U.S. government was doing UFOs and space aliens to cover up the development of these top-secret aircraft so that anybody who saw one flying by, they could say, ah, you're just one of those UFO kooks. And so now when we talk about the fact that the global warming situation has collapsed, and the infrastructure in this country has crumbled, you know, we're going to get HARP. Now, for those of you who are interested, this is what HARP is. The official name is High Altitude Auroral Research Project. It's very banal. stands for, uh, uh, well, basically, the, the idea was that we're going to use this array of antennas to heat the upper atmosphere and see what happened. Big deal. What it really is, and anybody who understands radio looking at the antenna array knows that's what this is. It is a test bed for low frequency directed over the horizon radar because high frequency radar can't see over the horizon can't bounce off the ionosphere harp is a test platform to see if they could but well, we got to take a break when we come back i'll fill in on the rest of what harp is trying to do and i don't think they're very successful we'll be right back What really happened with your host, Mike Rivero? You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. So just in a nutshell, what HARP really is, it is a test bed for over-the-horizon synthetic aperture radar. That large field full of antennas up there in Alaska is basically the same system that you would see on the Aegis radar, on the Aegis ships. It is electronically steerable. They don't have to move a dish around. They just change the phasing of the signal at each of those antennas, and collectively it points the beam to a different part of the sky. Now, the spy radar on the Aegis ships is very high frequency. It's designed to see small targets like incoming warheads. HARP is intended to bounce off the ionosphere and image large targets like fleets in the ocean over the horizon. Now, given the advent of space-based radar satellites, HARP may be a little bit obsolete. And I think they're kind of starting to shut down. I think their official website was shut down. But that's all it is. But just like the government was putting out stories about space aliens and UFOs to basically obscure the development of top-secret aircraft, 
uh, in uh, Area 51. The government puts out stories about tornado-making machines and earthquake-making machines to sort of obscure what HARP's real purpose was, because over-the-horizon radar, you know, it w would have been a very, very powerful tool uh, in, from the days of before satellite radar ocean reconnaissance satellites. So that's kind of what it is. And we know this is a recurring pattern with the government. They'll, they'll put out a nonsensical story to try and obscure a real story. No plane at the Pentagon, another good example from that. And that's not to say that there is not intelligent life out there in the universe. I just can't think of a reason they'd bother stopping by and see us, because tribal warfare and cannibalism still seems to be our primary occupations here. Which reminds me, there was a, another story on National Geographic that was trying to sell this idea that there's a real danger of alien invasion, and we're prepared, and our government is ready to defend you. Which is another one of these manufactured crises that the government spends a lot of your tax money getting ready to deal with. Because, first of all, it's a stretch to say that there'd be anything of any real interest on this planet that uh, an alien civilization would want, unless they evolved on an identical mirror world to Earth, same temperature, same chemistry, they're not going to find Earth comfortable at all. They're going to find their own world comfortable, and ours probably, they, they might view as unfriendly in the extreme. We certainly don't have any cultural treasures that are worth the leap across stars. And one of two cases are going to apply. If they don't have faster-than-light travel, we're going to see them coming from years on end. If they do have faster-than-light travel, there isn't anything we can do about it anyway. But this geographic show tried to spit it. We could go guerrilla tactics and that worked so well against us in Vietnam. And, you know, when we kill one-tenth of them, they will leave it. And it's nonsense. It's another classic case of making up a big, scary enemy that doesn't really exist to take money and freedoms away from you. And we know that there has been talk about faking an alien invasion to scare us all into accepting the new world order. And that's even mentioned in this show. Yes, the nations of the earth put down their differences and they unite together in the face of the blah, 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 blah. And they got it all from this Outer Limits ex, um, um, uh, episode uh, back in the 60s and uh, Architects of Fear. That was the name of the, uh, the episode where these scientists create a phony alien and a phony alien spaceship with which to scare the nations of the world into ending war and uniting together in a giant global government, which will then be on the hook to the International Monetary Fund uh, for the rest of uh, whatever. So anyway, you know, the, the, the government cannot fight against the truth except with more lies. And they're desperate to junk up the net with all kinds of nonsense that the corporate media can say, oh, look at what those silly people over there on the blogs believe, because they know they're losing ground. They know they're losing ground, just as the established political and religious order in Gutenberg's day fought hand and foot, tooth and nail to keep inexpensive books from the hands of ordinary people. The established political and religious order of today is fighting tooth and nail to keep a free and open Internet away from you. Because if they can't control what you're thinking, they can't control you. The first step to freedom is the freedom to decide for yourself. And the prerequisite for deciding for yourself is to have all the available information. And that's what the Internet is really, really all about here. All right, now I want to get back and talk about President Pussy, I mean President Obama. When he did his big speech last week, where he got up and he started talking about the 1967 borders and two-state solution and blah, 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 and I made the observation at that time, this is just for show, for the American voters going into 2012. President Obama and the entire United States Congress understand that groveling before Israel is not seen as a plus to 98% of the American voters. And so he's going to get up there and he's going to talk tough. And sure enough, the media said, yes, President Obama is talking tough to the, uh, you know, to Israel and all the rest of that. And I said, keep an eye on the speech Sunday before APAC, because that will be where Obama really shows his true colors regarding Israel. And sure enough, it came out. Obama is already out there. He's clarifying now that when he was talking about the 1967 borders, he didn't really mean the 1967 borders. He said, there's just been a policy that we should look at this, blah, blah. And he's already backpedaling, back and the entire world is watching him backpedal. And sure enough, when he got up to the, make his speech at, at AIPAC, he did what every president always does, 
promises to spend American tax dollars and American lives keeping Israel secure, and we're going to go after Iran. We're going to go after Iran. All righty, let's see. So the, the, the reality here is, I don't know about you, I'm tired of seeing American politicians who are totally focused on Israel to the exclusion of the problems we have here in the United States of America. Certainly we're seeing that in the American media. And that's why I keep putting out on my website, and I hope that you will uh, uh, put this out among your friends and family as well. No government can serve two masters. And a government that serves Israel does not serve the American people. America, especially now, on the edge of collapse, needs leaders who will put America first, second, and third. I don't want to hear about anybody being a friend to Israel. I want to hear them about being a friend to America and Americans. Or I am just not interested. And nobody talking about friend to Israel is going to get my support for this coming election season. We're going to go to the phones. Frank, uh, aloha. Uh, what's on your mind? Hi, bud. Um Got a, uh, an honest um, legal question for you. I know you can't answer it, and I, and I legally answer it, and I know it's just going to be an opinion, but can a person born in one country as a citizen of that country emigrate to another country? For example, somebody born in Libya, Libyan citizen. Oh, let me guess. This is the birth certificate thing again, isn't it? Yeah. Do you not take okay. that? All right, listen, we don't need to go into the minutia of legality. If there was anything at all to this birth certificate nonsense, John McCain and Hillary Clinton would have used it to get Obama out of their way. Period. End of discussion. Thank you for the call. Going to go to Don in Wisconsin. Aloha, Don. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Yes, uh, this, I don't know if you'll be able to do this or not, but uh, you, know, you are one of the most insightful people I, I have ever listened to. I don't know... How you do it, but if you have any kind of a, anything you care to share, like a bibliography or anything, I mean, where do you come from with this insight to the nuggets of truth? I come from Boston. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. I, no, I would I'm like serious. to know. A, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where I come from. I'm a heretic. Uh, you know, long ago, I made the decision in my life to abandon belief as a shaper of what I think and what I decide and what I know. And once you realize that belief is a, a method of enslavement, and once you abandon belief, whether it's belief in Santa Claus to get you to be a good kid, or belief in benevolent government to get you to go off to wars without any particular reason, or belief in a divine being who was going to take you all up to heaven last Sunday, once you stop using belief, once you stop allowing belief to control your thoughts, then the people who use beliefs to control you lose all power over you. And you just look around and see what makes sense. And, and, and the rules are really very simple. You know, get all the facts, make your own choice. Don't rely on a figure of authority. The primary reason to distrust somebody in authority is that they are in authority. And when you're looking at all these lies and propaganda, look for what should be there and isn't. And 90% of the time, that will tell you who is lying and who is telling you the truth. That's why we were able to spot these, these phony bin Laden Photoshop pictures first of the month. I think... I think one thing that probably would make it all elusive to most of us is we just aren't smart enough to perceive it the way you do. I disagree. I disagree. I think what people are lacking in is self-confidence and faith in themselves. You have to understand the biggest decision you've got to make is to decide you're going to be your own best analyst, you're going to be your own best detective, and, you're, and you are just as smart as the people in the mainstream media. I think that was proven when Cheech Marin absolutely embarrassed Anderson Cooper on Jeopardy, which may support the idea that smoking marijuana does stimulate brain cell growth, but that's another issue entirely. The people who are on the corporate media aren't smart. They just look good, and they speak convincingly whatever's on the teleprompter in front of them. And I have, I have a lot of confidence in the American people. I think ultimately if you start thinking for yourself and deciding for yourself, you're all collectively pretty much going to make the right decisions. There will be some people who go off on a wrong path, but they'll average each other out. I think that depending upon your age, you would be a person that the masses would follow. Uh, well, I believe that. Uh, I want the masses to follow themselves. You know, I almost feel like I'm back in life with Brian. You don't need a messiah. You know, uh, you, you really follow yourselves. 
you know, decide for yourself what is moral. Decide for yourself what is right and wrong. Decide for yourself whether the wars are necessary. The bottom, I follow me. I trip and fall. Well, the bottom line is that was just the point I was going to make, is that most people probably don't enjoy the degree of success that would give them the confidence to think that they're right more than they're wrong. If they're honest the only, with them, the if they're honest they don't, with themselves. No, the only reason they don't have that confidence is because, you know, parents and school and teacher are always giving you the message. You're not as smart as the people in government. You're not as smart as the people in media. You're not as smart as these authority figures that we decorate with all of this gratuitous awards to, to puff them up and make them look important. Like when Obama gets his Nobel Peace Prize and Al Gore gets his Peace Prize. And we begin to understand those awards are not based on merit. They're merely decorations to convince you that these people, you should let these people tell you what to think rather than deciding for yourself. Well, you probably know that you don't believe that they're that smart. But the point is, you probably, if you're at all honest with yourself, you realize you're probably not that smart yourself either. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I would agree with you on that last one. You know, the, the more I learn, the less I seem to know. And I, I think that's tr probably true for most people. We're, we're all raised to be very insecure. But, I, you know, I know one thing that I accept as an absolute fact. You're all smart enough to figure out what to do with your own life. You're all smart enough to figure out what to do with your own life and don't let anybody else come in and tell you what to do it. Because what they tell you to do with your life is not for your benefit, it's for their own. Money in the collection plate, soldiers for the army, taxes for the global warming, whatever. I agree with it's you completely. Thank, thank you for your okay. time. You're a delight to listen to. Well, thank you very much, sir, and thank you for that phone call. All righty, moving right along here. Now... Coming out of Barack Obama's speech last week, where the subtext was to the Palestinians, don't declare a state, we're going to get Israel and Palestine back to the negotiating table, and already Bibi Netanyahu said, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. No 67 borders, you know, the Palestinians, you know, uh, blah, 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 and perhaps not surprisingly. The Palestinians have said, we are continuing on this statehood movement at the United Nations. And Israel cannot stop it because it's a General Assembly vote, and it's moving forward. And so Obama basically humiliated himself in the United States of America and did not get anything for it, did not accomplish any agenda, whether it was for the United States or certainly for Israel. All right, we're going to go back to the phones. Andrea in Oklahoma. Aloha, Andrea. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, yes, I was perusing your website uh, before you came on and saw that they were going to uh, vote on the Patriot Act on renewing it. I mm -hmm. went ahead, even though I know it's, you know, uh, wasting my time, but I did it anyway. And I, I, I still advise everybody to go ahead and, and call their representatives, like I did, and say they're against the Patriot Act, and to vote it down. And I asked what their view was, uh, what uh, Imhoff and Colburn's view was, and they're basically going to vote it back in. Um, I also saw that you had a, a really uh, interesting idea. It looked like Grand Central Station, where people had evidently gotten together and planned a little song about uh, freeing Palestine. And... Uh, it, it, it went on, I guess, for about five minutes before the police broke it up. But there were it showed like hundreds and hundreds of people that were going through Grand Central Station, and they were all filming it with their their ready uh, their telephones and stuff. So yep. it, it, the message got out. They got their song out, and it, and they got you know they they were holding up their banners and. And before they were all dispersed, they, at least they got a message out, and that was that well. Was they so they wonderful. did, they did, and it went viral. And every poll that's being run shows that the vast majority of ordinary Americans support the formation of a Palestinian state, and that you know Israel should, like every other country on earth, draw their borders finally and agree to live within them. Why is Israel allowed to basically operate without borders? And every other nation, yeah, we got to put that line on that map, and we've got to learn to live within it. And I, I think the days when Israel could get by, you know, just riding the the, the heightened uh, heightened sympathy from World War II, those days are over because all of that stuff, whether it happened or not, and I don't want to even get into that debate right now. It's the first half of the previous century. It happened before pretty much all of us were born. It certainly happened before I was born. 
And we need to get back to living in the 21st century and deal with the evils and atrocities and ethnic cleansing we see before us right here and right now because we can do something about what Israel is doing to Palestine. We can't change the history of Nazi Germany, no matter how much we may wish to. But we can change the history of present-day Palestine, and we ought to. I have one thing that I, I, I questioned for a long time. Um, <clears throat> even though Kennedy was shot, and then Bobby Kennedy was shot, um, do you think the Kennedys, the family, even though there is the mafia and the bankers and everything, what do they have to lose by coming out and saying exactly that? It was the bankers. It was the mafia. It was all these things, and making it public Whereas, you know, if, if like... Well, I think to the answer to the question, I, I have to cut you off, Andrea, because we're coming up on the end of the segment. I think the answer to that is, I think they were waiting to breed a bulletproof Kennedy from the marriage of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver, but that obviously has not worked out. No, the, the, seriously, the serious answer to the question is, can, the Kennedys are still a political family, and they're going to play by the rules because, you know, uh, Robert Kennedy got shot when he wanted to look at John Kennedy's assassination, and Ted Kennedy got run off the road at Chappaquiddick when he started talking about going in and looking at Robert and John F. Kennedy's assassinations. So the people are still out there. They still have guns, and I think most of our political families in this country are still very much afraid of those people. All right, we got to take a break. Andrea, thank you for the phone call. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Back to the show, and we're going to go to Scott in Wisconsin. Aloha, Scott. Welcome to the show. What's your, what's on your mind today? Hey, Michael. How you doing, brother? Hey, I wanted to ask you if you've seen what Utah did. Yes, I did. Yeah, I've been Utah, paying attention to that. Yeah, Utah, uh, they uh, legalized, uh, they were saying gold and silver coins as currency, and I just wanted to ask you uh, how you feel about that and uh, where do you think that would go? Well, that's what got Libya invaded, so I'd be very, very careful if I was up there in Utah. But then, you know, on the <laughs> other hand, those Mormons are really tough people. They've had a couple of, of rebellions up there already. You know, it's kind of, I think, uh, very instructive when you come to understand that when the United States of America was formed, all money was supposed to be silver and gold coin or a claim check thereof. Yes, there was paper money, but the paper money wasn't the money. It was merely a claim check that you could take to the bank and get the silver and gold on demand. That was the legal money. And printing paper certificates or coins that were not silver and gold, that weren't backed by anything, that was punishable by death under the Coinage Act of 17, uh, uh, 1720, no, 1792. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden we've gone through the mirror of the Federal Reserve where these pretty printed pieces of paper that are backed with nothing at all are the mandatory legal tender in the United States of America. And silver and gold coins are, in some cases, as we saw with uh, the Liberty Dollar, they're, they're open to prosecution. So I think what's going to happen here in Utah, this is going to create a state's right issue. There's going to be a conflict between the federal government that wants us all slaves to the Federal Reserve and the state of Utah that wants a value-based currency for their own people to use. And remember, this debate has ended in deaths before. You had Abraham Lincoln, who issued his greenbacks. You had Kennedy, who uh, issued silver, a new version of silver certificates called the U.S. Notes. And uh, they were killed. And so I expect that there will be a huge, huge fight on this. And it may be the action which basically provokes the beginning of the states seceding from the federal government. Because the states understand, just as you and I understand, that if we stay with the Federal Reserve System, we are all doomed to homelessness and poverty because the money junkies can't quit. They're hopelessly caught in their addiction. And everybody who tries to break away from the grip of the Federal Reserve, well, that's just an escaping slave. We've got to drag them back, and we've got to flog them, and we've got to cut off a toe so they can't run away again. And that's exactly the mindset that's going on here. The Federal Reserve note is a tool of enslavement, just like chattel ownership of humans, just like the belief in divine right. 
Well, Michael, you said it earlier, and I had, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, you just said it like with uh, Libya. You know, I agree with you that this, this could actually blow up because here they are doing the same thing. They want to get away from that corrupt currency of our Federal Reserve. And it's going to be interesting to, to see where this goes. Uh, but I do think that uh, you have a, you're right on with me, brother, to what you were saying. And I think mm-hmm. this is going to be interesting to follow this one out. But thank you for taking my call and counting on there, big guy. You got it. And, uh, yeah, it's, we're going to follow this very, very closely because the, the, the money junkies behind the International Monetary Fund and the Federal Reserve, which is sort of IMF light local branch, they're playing this huge scam on the entire planet called a debt-based currency. They have a license to counterfeit from every government that allows them to parasitize their people. And they use their money to buy their way into more and more governments, and they're basically trying to bring this system of, of banking to the entire world, even at the point of a bayonet. When we talk about this clash of civilizations between the West and Islam, what this is really about is a clash of banking systems, compound interest and fiat debt-based currency versus value-based currency and loan-plus-fee lending in the Islamic states. Our kids are dying over a banking system war. And I think that's a really stupid reason. What really happened with your host, Mike Rivero? Visit us online at whatreallyhappened.com. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. And uh, getting back to Barack Obama and his embarrassment this last week, he says he stands by his hallucination, I'm sorry, his vision for Mideast peace, which is basically simply a continuation of the same policy that has pointedly not worked for the last 60 years. But this is what his masters in Tel Aviv want. Stall, 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 grab a piece of land. Stall, 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 grab another piece of land. Stall, 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 grab another piece of land. And every nation on earth, except the United States, has a government intelligent enough to realize that Israel will never, of its own free will, allow a Palestinian state to come into being. That has been their declared agenda all the way back to the first United Nations partition plan, which Israel rejected. The United Nations had the right idea. It was very uncomfortable to steal part of Palestine to give to a new nation of Israel because, after all, we had just finished fighting World War II to tell Nazi Germany they couldn't grab grab part of Poland for their own use or grab part of France for their own use. And then we had to turn around and say that what Germany could not be allowed to do to Poland and France, the new nation of Israel would be allowed to do to Palestine. And that was uncomfortable enough. So the United Nations said, okay, this part will be Palestine and this part will be Israel. And the founders of Israel said, no, we reject that. The invisible man who lives in the clouds and who talks to nobody else but us says, this is all of ours. And David Ben-Gurion came out and declared Israel to be in existence. Harry Truman recognized the new nation of Israel, even though it didn't have borders. We've been off and running ever since. And the problem, the reason for all this discord in the Middle East comes down to a very simple hypocrisy. Israel will not grant to the Palestinians that which Israel demands for itself, a right to exist and live in peace. All Israel needs to do is say, okay, over here will be Israel, and over there you'll be Palestine, and here is the border, and we all agree to respect it. And we put down the guns, and we look over at Palestine and say, what do you have that we want to buy? The Palestinians look over there and say, what do you have that we want to buy? And you engage in commerce, and commerce is the path to peace. And as soon as Israel recognizes Palestine's right to exist, every other Arab nation in the Middle East will recognize Israel. It is that simple. And yet Israel can never admit to itself that it was wrong all this time to deny to Palestine what Israel demands for itself. It is that double standard, that hypocrisy on which all this bloodshed and mayhem and corruption rests. So Obama's obediently up there saying, yes, we're going to go back and we're going to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions, which 
is a violation of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty that the United States has signed. Now, over in Egypt, and I mentioned this was probably going to start happening, the people who led the first round of protests that brought down Hosni Mubarak are getting ready to do it again because the new boss has turned out to be very much like the old boss. Israel has met the new government of Egypt's price using American tax dollars, and the new government of Egypt is starting to act very much like the old government of Egypt, which was really illustrated when Egypt's navy blocked the latest humanitarian aid ship, the spirit of Rachel Curry, Curry, from arriving in Gaza, and they took it into Egyptian waters. Now they're escorting it out and saying, you must not go to Gaza because Israel has said it. And the people of Egypt didn't have a revolution to simply go back to living the way they had lived before at Israel's leave. And so they're getting ready to start a new round of riots and protestations there. Meanwhile, over in Spain, the revolution that everybody said wasn't going to happen, apparently it's starting to happen right now. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. America, welcome back to the show here, and uh, we're talking about the situation in the Mideast. Noam Chomsky has come out with a really good observation. For all the talk about democracy that we hear from the United States, it's absolutely the last thing they want anywhere in the Middle East. Gaza is a good example, because when Gaza was finally allowed to have elections, because of all the talk about, oh, we're bringing democracy to the region, Everybody said, okay, let's, let's see some. And the U.S. and Israel said, okay, we'll let the Gazans have an election. And the Gazans elected Hamas. The Gazans elected Hamas. And the U.S. and Israel said, no, 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 no. We didn't give you the right to vote so you could vote for the other guy. You have free elections only when you vote for the people that we like. And so they just sort of pretended the election didn't happen and imposed the starvation blockade on Gaza to get them to surrender their elected government and accept proxy rule through Fatah. All of that's moot now because Hamas and Fatah have shaken hands, formed a unified government, and Israel's trying to figure out some way they can break them back up again. But to get back to Noam Chomsky, he's saying basically the U.S. does not want democracy anywhere because any place that democracy is really put in, the first thing the people do is vote the United States to leave. And that is why every time the United States overthrows a country like Iran in 1953 or Chile, they put in a dictator who will allow the United States to stay in there and basically loot the place for American corporations. Because every time real democracy shows up, the first thing that happens, the people vote in a government that says, get rid of the United States. That's what started to happen in Egypt. And then the United States and, and uh, went in and threw a lot of money around and basically bought the government, same as they did the last one, trying to hijack these revolutions because the last thing the United States wants anywhere in the Middle East is democracy in the Arab world because the Arab world will break free of American hegemony and say, we want to chart our own co course into the future. We don't want a private central bank. We don't want American warships and warplanes flying over us all the time and docked in our harbors. And so Nome is absolutely correct. The U.S. and its allies, primarily Israel, are not going to want or allow governments which listen to the will of the people. Because then the United States cannot control the region and they will be asked to leave. We've been watching this already in Iraq where we brought democracy to Iraq and we brought this and we brought that. And, and every once in a while you'll hear the people of Iraq saying, you know, we'd kind of like to go back to being our own country now. We don't need the American occupiers anymore. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We weren't really aiding al-Qaeda 
and Saddam is dead, can't we go back to being our own country? And the U.S. will say, no. We're nation building, meaning they're, they're building an American nation on Iraqi soil, same as always here. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates is out there screaming that we can't allow any budget cuts to the U.S. military, even though we're starving and homeless and the roads are collapsing and the bridges are falling apart and everything. We, every dollar taken away from war to feed the American people represents a victory for global terrorism. I think some of the biggest money junkies there are are in the Pentagon. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of weird to realize that the Pentagon appears to be perfectly willing to starve the United States of America to death in the name of protecting it from enemy attack. And I think that if America's greatness rests on bombs and bullets, that I, for one, am willing to relinquish that greatness I would prefer a peaceful, prosperous, non-great America to America as the greatest war power in history continuing to inflict death and destruction and torture across the face of the globe. So, all right, we're going to move around uh, a little bit to the other side of the planet, to over there at Fukushima, which is getting to be a real, real problem. Uh, uh, TEPCO in Japan will make an announcement about, oh, we're going to do this, and then it doesn't work. Oh, we're going to do that, and that doesn't work. It's now coming out. I mean, we're more than two months away from where this happened, and we're only just now being officially informed of what really happened at those reactors. Now, we've all surmised it here on the blogosphere. We have been looking at the available factual evidence and intuiting and, and deducing what happened. And most of our... Uh, prognostications and analysis have proven to be correct. But now they're admitting that two of the nuclear reactors at Fukushima were damaged by the earthquake before the tsunami ever hit. And this means the reactor designs themselves were flawed because they were supposed to survive this. Apparently, three of the six reactors were running, and all three of the reactor's pressure relief systems failed to operate, which is what led to the meltdowns. Now, as we mentioned, when General Electric designed these reactors, three of their top scientists and engineers resigned, refused to sign their names onto the design plans because of perceived deficiencies to save a few dollars here and there. Now, General Electric might be off the hook, if it turns out that the Siemens controllers used on those pressure relief systems are all infected with Stuxnet, which we know was designed to wreck nuclear power stations and was known to be around Japan last November, around the area of the Fukushima reactor. So at this point, it's a 50-50 toss-up whether or not Stuxnet had gotten inside the reactors. And it may, in fact, have been a factor in this cascade of, of incidents that led to the disaster we see before us. But we need to find that out. If Stuxnet is not in those reactors control systems, then the fault for this disaster rests squarely on General Electric, whose reactors did not perform as they were supposed to. Japan and TEPCO are now acknowledging that the erratic and inconsistent information being released to the media uh, has led to a loss of confidence and trust in TEPCO in Japan. Gee, you think? So, anyway, moving right along here. Apparently, the United States ran a secret terror hunt in Sweden without the permission of the government. They're all upset about what's going on. Meanwhile, coming from Site Intelligence Group, the Israeli propaganda operation, the new manufactured head of the toilet, I'm sorry, Al-Qaeda, uh, has screamed that in the name of Allah, the munificent, he's going to tear the tags off of all of your couch cushions, Tap dance barefoot on your shag carpets, and he's going to fart in all of your elevators or something. And if Rita Katz is saying it, it must be true. Absolutely must be true. See, we're down to the understudies now. The original scarecrows designed to terrorize us. I mean, the U.S. government and the corporate media, they're the biggest terrorists in the world. They're the ones keeping us terrorized so that we'll go fling our babies and our money onto the enemy's bayonets. But they've burned out their original scarecrows. Everybody knows Al-Qaeda in Arabic slang means the toilet. 
we've we've re- revealed that Adam Gadon was really Adam Perlman, Yusuf Al Khattab was really uh, 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 Joseph Cohen, Amzi Al Amraki, the guy who uh, terrorized South Park. His real name is Zachary Chesser. Last I heard, he's still living with his mother. And they're all fakes and phonies. And now, of course, you know, most of us knew that the real Bin Laden died almost 10 years ago. A phony Bin Laden was killed on national television first of this month. So they're already getting up the understudies. They need a new generation of boogeyman to make sure that you will salute the flag and fling your money and your children onto Israel's enemies. And so now we have the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a nice, safe name. There's no possibility of a mistranslation. Al-Qaeda is oh so 20th century. Now it's the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the same players, same people. It's just another phony group to demonize the Muslims leading to war. But again, let history be your guide. Iran became an Islamic state in 1979. How many nations have they invaded since then? It's a trick question. They haven't invaded anybody. Look at Israel during the same interval of time. Attacks on, on Iraq. Syria, bombing missions on those, uh, attack on Lebanon, West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon again, Gaza again, on and on and on. United States, I can't even begin to name how many countries have been attacked or invaded by the United States since 1979. Now, the United States is officially secular, but primarily Christian. Israel proclaims itself the Jewish state. So, looking at the, uh, of the lessons of history between the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims, which is the one which is not starting all the wars and attacks? That's Iran and the Muslims. So the Christians in the United States and the Jews in Israel have to lie to you. They have to convince you that the Muslims are evil and that we must go make war on them. But history is against them. History shows who the real threat to world peace is, and it's not Iran. We're on the wrong side of this, this conflict. We're on the wrong side of this burgeoning new world war. All war is based in deception. Sun Tzu wrote that in The Art of War. And basically, when a world leader wants to take his nation to war, when he wants to initiate a war, he's got to lie to his own people to get them to go along with it, whether it's Lyndon Johnson lying about torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin or lies about a Spanish mine sinking the USS Maine in Havana Harbor or the lies about Pearl Harbor actually having been a secret attack when everybody, including the Madsen Steamship Company, knew the Japanese were coming. And Roosevelt goaded the Japanese into the attack. Hitler, with the uh, phony attack on Glywitz, blamed on Poland. Burning of the Reichstag. Most major wars are started with a hoax, a fraud, or a lie. And here in the United States of America is no different. Our government is no more evil or no more good than any other government on Earth. It is racist to think that America is immune from these kind of politics just because we're America. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show here. And I'm uh, uh, going to skip over here to Great Britain. A funny story just came through what really happened.com. Apparently, there's been a huge, huge panic where they, they got out the British police in southern England and they thought there was an escaped wild animal from a zoo and they're out there with the helicopters and tranquilizer guns and it turned out to be a toy tiger. <laughs> and just everybody went into a complete panic. Everybody, everybody's, you know, we're on this hypersensitivity, you know, where we have the media constantly screaming at us, death, doom, destruction, terror, fashion show, film at 11. And the idea is to keep everybody rattled and scared so we can't think clearly. And, you know, there's an object lesson there, because when once a government decides it's going to use fear on its own population to get what it wants, it can't quit. 
Once a government uses terror to scare you into war or higher taxes or surrendering your freedoms, it can't ever stop. It can't let the public calm down enough to start thinking clearly. Because if that happens, the government is finished. That's what happened in Egypt. Over and over again, we kept hearing the same thing from the Egyptian uh, revolutionaries. We just stopped being afraid. And once they stopped being afraid and they started thinking, Mubarak was finished. Mubarak was absolutely finished. The push for a global new world order, global financial system, I think, has triggered a global revolution. That seems to be what's going on. Now, speaking of Great Britain, new wrinkle in the Dr. Kelly assassination cover-up. Now, if you remember, uh, Dr. Kelly basically was one of the witnesses during the hearings on the dodgy dossier, which we now all know with the wisdom of history looking back, was basically a ginned-up document, was plagiarized from a 12-year-old outdated student thesis paper. And it was used to justify Britain's entry into the war in Iraq because they're going to attack us in 45 minutes, and they've got germs and chemicals and weapons of mass destruction, all of which turned out to be lies. And Dr. David Kelly was one of the key witnesses in that whole situation. And then all of a sudden he's found dead along the tr pathway he likes to walk for exercise, and it was declared immediately a suicide. Oh, he was under such stress. He was under such pressure. Actually, no, he wasn't. He was done testifying. He was looking forward to going back to work. He was getting ready to go public on some other information he had about Tony Blair and the manufacturing of the lies that sent so many British young people to their deaths in Iraq. And so Dr. David Kelly was found dead. Oh, it's a suicide. Nothing to see here. And there were so many uh, pieces of evidence against it, including the medication he was supposed to have been on, uh, the fact that both wrists were slashed, which you can't do all by yourself, if you think about that very, very carefully. And now there's this situation about his dental records, because apparently on the same uh, day that he his body was found, there was a break-in at his dentist's office, and Dr. Kelly's dental records went missing for 48 hours, and then they magically reappeared. Now, dental records are something that you use to make sure that the dead body you've arranged to have is the dead body you intended to have. So the dental records went back in the office, and Assistant Chief Constable Michael Page of Thames Valley Police had told the Hutton inquiry into the death there were no unidentified fingerprints on Dr. Kelly's file. Now, in response to the British equivalent of a Freedom of Information Act request, has found out that, yeah, there were unidentified fingerprints on the dental records and on the folder holding them. Oh, my goodness. Assistant Chief Constable Michael Page of Thames Valley Police lied. And they're saying the discrepancy raises doubt about the evidence given to the Hutton inquiry. Now, what's really amazing here is seeing all of these people at the BBC continuing to work as hard as they can to stand there with their hair on fire and tell the public they don't smell any smoke. It should be obvious to everybody this is a cover-up, and the cover-up means that the assassination was actually a murder. So I think it's time that we waterboard Assistant Chief Constable Michael Page of the Thames Valley Police and find out what really happened here. All right, moving along here to the economy. By the way, the phone lines are open, 800-313-9443, 800-313-9443. By the way, we just put up a YouTube video at whatreallyhappened.com that goes further and further into the details over the fact that America's intervention in Libya, you know, not let the Libyans sort out their own problem with Gaddafi, but America's intervention, NATO's intervention in Libya, has a lot more to do with the fact that Gaddafi was trying to set up a state-issued value-based currency, not just for Libya, but for all of Africa. Apparently, Gaddafi had introduced the gold dinar, and he had accumulated enough gold to issue it as a currency all across the north part of the continent. And other African nations were saying, yeah, we want to do this. We don't want any more of that international monetary fund thing where they come in and plunge us permanently into debt we can never get out. We're going to go with the gold dinar. And that right there seems to be the real motive for the attack on Libya. Keep the slaves slaves. Oh, my goodness, the slaves are trying to break free. Well, if we kill enough of them, they'll go back to being happy slaves. 
Now, speaking of slavery here in the United States of America, oh, we got to take a break. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. What really happened with your host, Mike Rivero? Join Mike on the air. Call toll-free 800-313-9443. 800-313-9443. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. And I want to talk a little bit about the economy. Uh, the little story came out earlier today about how the Federal Reserve is considering tighter credit as the economy improves. Now, first of all, the economy is not improving. Unless you're a Wall Street CEO, in which case you're raking it in, but for the vast majority of America, for 90% of America, the economy is not improving. Things are getting worse. We've Here in Hawaii, we've had a 12.5% increase in the rate of new job claims over last year, double digit. The economy is not improving. TSA is destroying our tourism. And the local media likes to proclaim, we have an 80% hotel occupancy, which is, sounds really good until you realize how many hotels have flat out gone out of business. When you have 80% occupancy of only one-third of the hotels you used to have before, that's not exactly a rosy picture. So the Fed considers tightening credit. Now, what they really mean is they're going to start raising interest rates. They lowered interest rates to stimulate borrowing because, remember, borrowing is what allows the Federal Reserve to issue new printed money. And if they cannot get the American people to borrow, and we haven't been, then they get the U.S. government to borrow on your behalf without your permission, which is where a lot of these bailouts and TARP and everything coming from. The U.S. government is going to the Federal Reserve and saying, we'll borrow money from you on behalf of the taxpayers, and we'll force them to pay it back plus interest. But even that is not enough to keep the system going. So now the Fed is basically going to start cranking up the credit, uh, the, the, uh, the interest rates. They got everybody is firmly on the hook. They can't get anybody on the hook anymore. They're going to start cranking up the interest rates. And perhaps, not surprisingly, we got this notification here from Bank of America with this little notice in here that as of June 25th of this year, uh, there'll be a penalty percentage rate applied to credit cards of 30%. I mean, they say 29.99%, but, you know, it's 30%, one-third per annum interest applied as a penalty, okay? Now, why does the penalty apply? Well, if you have a bad credit rating, if your credit worthiness is not as high as it used to be, then Bank of America will throw this 30% interest onto your credit card purchases. Now, in this economy where the jobs are still being sent overseas, and we have an article about that at whatreallyhappened.com you need to look at. I'll talk about that in a minute. But in this economy where the jobs are continuing to leave, everybody's credit rating has gone into decline unless you're the CEO of a major Wall Street corporation. Now, the good news is that Bank of America, under the current laws, is only allowed to apply this 30% usury on new purchases. So, folks, if you have a Bank of America credit card, cut it up right now because any new purchases as of June 25th, they're going to slap that 30% interest rate on under any excuse they can find. Late with a payment, 30%. Your credit rating takes a hit, 30%. They're going to be looking for excuses to get usurious. This is the time to cut up those credit cards. If you can't pay cash for it, do without. The looting of America is underway. We have a coffee mug we sell around here. I wish more of you were buying them. The last official act of any government is to loot the nation. That's what's going on here. The government and the Federal Reserve are inseparable. They are united together against the general population, the very essence of a fascist state. Corporations and government align together against the general population. And the looting is underway under the guise of, hey, you deserve it because you have lousy credit. But why do we all have lousy credit? Well, because the U.S. government took your jobs away. They sent them overseas in order to make it easier for the banks to start grabbing homes in order to pay for the fraudulent mortgage-backed securities. It's really that obvious. When all the foreign banks and investors realized they had been scammed, they were the victims of the biggest financial swindle in history over these mortgage-backed securities, and they came back and they said, you've got to buy back the bad paper because this is fraud. And we don't, have to, we don't have to live with this, and we don't have to accept the losses which are wrecking the banks around the world. 
And so the banks looked around and said, well, you know, we need a new source of wealth to put on our balance sheets or we're going to collapse. And the government said, well, look at all those houses out there. Just start grabbing those. We'll just we'll just give corporations tax breaks to ship all the manufacturing jobs to other countries. And then they won't be able to meet their mortgage payments and you can go in and take their homes and it looks like it's their own fault. Isn't that cool? Wall Street said, yeah, we'll do that. And that's what happened. In fact, there's a story here where uh, Obama is still meeting with these top corporations about accelerating the offshoring of jobs because apparently as many homes the banks have taken, still not enough to get them out of trouble. Meanwhile, there was an interesting little piece of propaganda, and I put it up at whatreallyhappened.com, and it's just an absolute shovel load of bovine excrement. The headline is, what if you had to buy American? And it's basically a screed about if if you start demanding that American manufacturing come back and that we stop importing everything, look at all the things you'll have to do without. And it goes down all the things that we import from other countries that we no longer make here. Now, to me, the solution is let's start making them here. But this article is basically trying to convince everybody that things are fine the way they are and that we shouldn't tinker with it. The money junkies love it. With the American jobs gone to overseas so they can take your houses, and they're sitting on those, those importation channels, they get to reap untold profits for no more than simply packing things up and shipping them across the ocean. And this article is a piece of propaganda to convince you that you love things the way they are too. And I know you're smart enough to know that you don't that you know that this country has gone off in a hideously wrong direction, that being forced to be dependent on overseas factories for our basic necessities makes us slave to the people who own those overseas factories. The second biggest crime committed by the U.S. government against the American people was to allow our manufacturing to deteriorate. This is why auto, Toyota auto factories in the United States and Canada are shut down right now because they're dependent on parts from factories in Japan that have been destroyed by the quake and the loss of electrical power. And that's why this whole globalism nonsense is so dangerous. We need regionalism. We need communities, small communities that produce everything they need locally in order to remain free and independent. Globalism is just a way of making us all dependent on everybody else as a means to keep us from breaking free. And now we're seeing the reasons why it doesn't work. Because the system is breaking down all across the globe. All right, we're going to take a phone call. We've got John in California. Aloha, John. Thank you for waiting. What's on your mind? Hello there, Michael. Uh, good afternoon. you got a great show as usual. And uh, Thank you. Uh, see, I, Mike, the reason I called, I just need your help on uh, on getting to the bottom of uh, some data information I heard. I, 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 but anyway, it, it, it's, it goes like this. Many of my fellow Roman Catholics are, are very uh, buying into all this stuff about the upcoming war between Muslims and Catholics or ecumenical Christians, and mm. uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit skeptical of that myself for various other reasons. But what well, I heard just would love in the to last... See that happen. Yeah, and just in the last week, though, what's what people are making a big deal about? I guess uh, the pastor allowed uh, some girl to come to our church service after mass, and uh, from the pulpit, start talking about how the uh, the population in the um, of Palestinian Christians in the in the Holy Land area is is down from forty or fifty or sixty percent or whatever it used to be, some high percentage, down to two uh, percent. Of all, mm -hmm. of, and, and and they specifically said the reason why it's down so low is because Christians have been fleeing the area because their churches and their schools have been attacked by uh, gunmen who would come in and kill a whole bunch of people and you know all that kind of nasty stuff. So I did a browser search on a phrase similar to to just that. You know, why are all the Palestinian Christians down to two percent? I got all kinds of stuff. You know about about shootings by Muslims of, of people in Coptic churches. And, and so I don't know what, you know, do you okay, have any, well, can you help me out? Yeah, I can. I is can. the intelligence very, agency very, setting this up or what? Well, actually, Israel is. Israel's a master okay. of, of making you and him fight. 
I mean, when Israel attacked the USS Liberty, Israel was trying to tell the United States it was Egypt doing it until the Liberty refused to sink and it became common knowledge that Israel was behind the attack. When Israel uh, uh, bombed the King David Hotel, uh, they had agents dressed in Arab clothes to put the blame on the Arabs. It's called a false flag attack. Correct. Correct. Uh, I'm with you. This is, this is why we have uh, Adam Perlman putting a towel on his head and claiming to be Adam Gadon and then screaming about death to America. You know, it's all part of the hoax. Israel doesn't want to fight their own wars. They love having the weapons and all the toys to play with. But when it comes down to the actual wet work, they want to get somebody else to do it. And, you know, so, you know, Israel cannot go off and, and fight the entire Islamic banking system all by themselves. They need to get somebody else to do it for them. And, you know, Israel would absolutely love for the Christians and the Muslims to basically slaughter each other. Uh, and, and Israel gets to step back and say, well, the world is ours now. I, and I'm, so what my understanding of what's going on with the Palestinian Christians mm -hmm. is uh, there have been a few attacks by people. We don't know who they are. We know who we're supposed to blame for it. But the, the political repression and the economic repression and the restrictions placed on Christians and their places of worship. Last Easter was a classic example. I mean, Israel loves the tourism dollars. Christians will fly in and they want to see all these holy places. And then at the last second, they throw up the security barriers and say, sorry, we can't let you there. There's a terror, there's a terror threat. Mm. And so it, it's kind of amazing when you see in the United States of America all these Christian Zionists. Yeah, and they think that their their ticket past the pearly gates uh, depends on unquestioning support of Israel and its policies. Correct. And if and if you go to Israel and you watch how the Israelis have absolutely no respect back for the Christians, and it, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, it's not a two way street. Israel demands support and respect from the Christians, but gives none of it back whatsoever. And the reason for the decline in the Palestinian Christians, I mean, there's the oppression on the Palestinians to begin with. Uh, you know, Israel is trying to displace everybody who's around those holy sites because they see that as part of the future Israel, if it's not already part of Israel, and it's part of Israel's tourism revenues. So they want Israel to benefit and nobody else. And so it's more political and economic. There have been a few attacks, and they're always blamed on, on Palestinian terrorists. But, but you know, I, I understand from friends who are actually in Israel that there's a huge organized crime problem there. And the, the, the crime lords are bombing each other's nightclubs. And every time the media will say, oh, must have been a Palestinian suicide bomber. Mm. And so no matter what happens, it's blamed on the Arabs and the Muslims and the Palestinians, even when it's just organized crime having a, a turf war. You know, Michael, one of the websites that I visited, and again, I'm trying to sift through all this uh, confusing data, uh, they made a very good case. Of this. They said, uh, well, um, Egypt is uh, primarily a Muslim country, but they also have a substantial Christian population, and that Christian population is still pretty much the same. You know, and they, they yeah, went to a few other countries like that. Iran. The same is true of Iran. Iran has a huge Christian right. population. They have a huge Jewish population. Right. And they're treated so well in Iran that when Israel offered money, to the Iranian Jews to relocate to Israel, the Iranian Jews said, no, we're comfortable here. We'll stay, thank you very much. And one, one of the sites I went to actually addressed that very question that I'm, I'm posing to you right now, and, and uh, it was some, some uh, speaker on behalf of, of Christians, but it, it was dated in 1998, and they said, we, you know, we've heard all this before, and there's absolutely no truth to this rumor about you know, Muslims coming in and shooting people in churches. But again, it's so old. You know, I don't, I don't know how useful it yeah, is no, right I, now. I, I, again, go back and look at history, and you will see that you know, in order to sell a new war, you know, uh, to the American people against the Arab Muslims, in order to get them to sacrifice their children to make the world safe for compound interest and fiat debt currency, right? All right. The propagandists look. have to have to portray Arab Muslims as evil, bad people, you know, deserving of being killed. It's like right. back during Vietnam when we had to dehumanize the Vietnamese and call them slants and gooks and all the rest, that dehumanization process. That's what they're doing against the Arab Muslims here. But again, look at history. Since 1979, Iran doesn't attack countries. They don't invade anybody else. It's Israel and the United States that are constantly attacking, constantly stealing other people's lands and resources. And the propagandists are trying to basically convince you that we're good to do so. We're good to act like barbarians and pirates. And the Iranians and the Muslims who basically just want to sit home and take care of business and commerce, they're somehow evil. The, the last the thing I want to say, yeah, go ahead, Michael, was that I, I, I'm with you. Uh, you. You know, I'm 
I appreciate what you're saying. I, I just have an easier time of it when someone starts talking about this woman, Bridget Gabriel, because I listened to her several times a couple of years ago, and she let slip that she's associated with the intelligence community. Well, right off the bat, that's a red flag. You know? Oh, yeah. So, so, it, it, so it's, it's easier for me to do that knowing, <laughs> hey, here's what she said, you know. <laughs> You know, well, so, you know, a lot of these people have blown their cover. I mean, Rita Katz, you know, her father yeah. was executed in Israeli spy. Um, uh, you need to go out with a search engine and find an article called Selective Memory, because memory, which is providing all these articles and terror things to the Western media, they've been busted as an Israeli propaganda operation. You know, if you're going to have a war, you've got to lie the people into it. And that's exactly what's going on. We know that leaders lie to their people. They've been doing it ever since Ramses the Great lied to the Egyptian people about whipping the Hittites at Kadesh. He didn't. He almost lost his army. But yeah. you look at the temples of uh, uh, Abu Simbel and Abydos and Karnak and uh, Ramsey's victory over the Hittites, it's carved in there. That was the CNN of the day. Yeah. That's where he went to get the news, and the news was lying just as much as it is today. Well, okay. Michael, if you have any spare time and you're looking for something to write about, I'd be happy to go to your website and see the, ve the results of your research on this. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks yeah, a lot well, for your help. As much as I can, there's only so much, Michael, to go around, and they wouldn't let me clone me. Apparently, there's some dumb law against that thing. Thanks a lot for the call, John. Switching over to David in Iowa. Aloha, David. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Mike. Uh, just uh, watching C-SPAN. Uh, watching you on Justin TV and watching C-SPAN and watching Rand Paul go on about the Fourth Amendment. And, you know, it reminds me of the fact that uh, I know that you know this, that there's a uh, couple of Israeli companies that through the NSA have the uh, no-bid contract to monitor all telecommunications in, yeah, hi, <laughs> in the United States. And that seems to me like why APAC would support this bill so effectively, not only the value of the information, but the economics, because they don't provide all that information to the U.S. government for free. They no, they don't. It's, it. it's big, big, big business. This actually goes back all the way uh, to just before 9-11, and it was kind of interesting because when 9-11 happened, Carl Cameron over at Fox News was doing a four-part series on this scandal where it turned out there were a couple of major companies, and there is not only Israeli-owned, uh, but they're, they're tied in with these Israel's government and intelligence services. One was Amdocs, which did telephone bill processing for virtually every telephone in the United States of America. Now, they weren't listening to the phone calls, but they had a record of who was calling who, which through a process called traffic analysis uh, can be very, very valuable intelligence. And I think we have to take a break here. And so, uh, David, stick around. We'll be right back. What this country is coming to I sure would like to know If they don't do something by and by The rich will live and the poor will die Doggone, I mean the panic is on and aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. We're talking with David and I, and we're talking uh, about this huge spy scandal that erupted right around the time of 9-11. was the largest foreign spy operation ever found operating in the United States of America being run by Israel. And it, it was sort of stumbled over because drug enforcement officers in the United States of America, every time they were closing in on Israeli drug criminals, uh, ecstasy rings and so forth, the raids, somehow, the, the Israelis were finding out about the raids ahead of time and they were being foiled. And the investigation basically discovered that these Israeli-owned companies that are on the American telecommunications infrastructure were leaking the information to Israeli drug criminals. And that basically led to this uncovering of this entire spy operation. So you had Amdocs that was processing all the telephone billing records for every phone in America, and they knew who was calling who. Then you had another system called Converse Infosys. Now, they've changed their name since then. But they're the company that the U.S. government goes to to install automated phone tapping equipment on all of America's telephones. In the good old days, the police or the FBI would have to go into the crossbar racks and actually get on there with alligator clips to listen to a specific phone call. But now the means to listen to your phone conversations is built into the system. Any law uh, officer or Israeli spy with access to the system, can sit anywhere in America, type in your phone number, and immediately listen to your phone call. 
And that was put in by Converse Infosys. And, of course, it was discovered, you know, big surprise, that Converse Infosys had left backdoors into the system for Israeli intelligence to use. And, of course, oh, finally, there was, yeah. And so, basically, yeah, it's this huge, huge uh, security system. And, you know, Israel always gets these contracts because they own the U.S. Congress. And the Congress will go to whoever's handing out the contracts and say, you give it to my good buddy over there at uh, at Amdocs or Info, because they're, they're donors and they're contributors and they're tremendous backers. And if you look at how many Israeli companies are in critical positions within our infrastructure, displacing American companies perfectly able and willing and capable of the same tasks and without the security risk of having foreign ownership, and you begin to realize the degree of betrayal that's going on here. I'll give you one more example because we're almost at the end of the show. On 9-11, Odaigo, which is, again, an Israeli-owned company that provides all the backbone services for instant messaging in America. They have an office in New York near the World Trade Center. Two hours before the attack, they received a message warning them, get out of your office, something's going to happen. They even captured the, issue, the issuing IP, where that came from. And this is before the airplanes used in the attacks had even taken off from the ground. And wow. so the FBI comes in, and, and Odaigo gives them the IP of who sent them the message, and that was the end of it. The FBI went away, and they never followed up on that. Well, you know, they have gag orders out there now that are, they can put on virtually anyone involved in the industry that if they ever say anything about it, even if they're involved in a crime, and they know they're involved in a crime, but they were issued a gag order, they could go to jail for the rest of their life if they say anything about it. Oh, or worse. I mean, our government's that. coming down hard on whistleblowers, and basically, the you know, now Obama is saying he can declare war on any American, even within the borders. And, of course, Israel has maintained their right to assassinate anybody anywhere in the world for any reason they feel like doing so. And so we're basically in an era of thugism where if you annoy the government, they will kill you. And that is the essence of dictatorship. Thank you for the call, David. We've run out of time today. We'll be back tomorrow here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Until then, stay safe, stay well, stay angry, stay skeptical. Trust your own brain and aloha, America.